Welcome, everybody. Today, I am going to be discussing a pretty awful topic, as if all death investigation topics are not awful, but this one is especially bad. So we're going to be talking about accident death investigations involving infants and children. This is a pretty rough topic, so trigger warning, we're going to be talking about some bad stuff, and it is going to be related to infants and children specifically, and primarily accidents. So we're talking about things that happen to kids age zero all the way up to about 14, 15 years old, sometimes a little bit older, but we're going to be focusing on the children uh, today. So it, it is bad if you have young children and you have not investigated these cases before. They are especially hard, uh, especially as a parent, but you have to be prepared, right? As a death investigator, you have to be aware of what's going on, what type of cases you're going to get, and you have to be aware of what you're going to need to do when you go out and investigate these cases. You don't want to investigate your first infant or a child death and be so disturbed by it that you're not even able to conduct your investigation. So you have to prepare, and that's why we're doing this training. So I do all of these podcasts for free. They are accessible on the Death Investigation Training Academy website through Corner Talk. All right, so here we go. First, we have to discuss manner of death. As a coroner or medical examiner, your focus is determining cause of death, which is the anatomical reason for the death, and then the manner of death, which is the classification of death. Let's first get into what is an accident. So natural deaths, of course, are a natural disease process. It could be cancer or it could be pneumonia, could be some kind of a disease, uh, maybe chronic alcoholism. Those are all natural disease processes, something that is going to develop over time. That is not going to be classified as an accident. Suicide. Suicide is a self-inflicted injury. It's something that someone does to themselves. Now, suicide deaths can occur in younger people, but we're not going to discuss that today. We're going to focus primarily on the accidents. Homicides. It's injury inflicted by another person or death at the hands of another. That's the definition. So again, we're going to be focusing on accidents. Accidents then are unintentional injuries. It's something that happens when you're not expecting it. It could be anything from an airplane crash to a motor vehicle accident. It could be something falling off a building and hitting you. It could be falling into a well. It could be a drowning. Uh, there are many accidents that can happen. And today we're going to focus on primarily things that happen to infants and children. What are the possibilities? What are you going to have to do when you go out to these scenes? What information do you need? Who are you going to talk to when you go out here and investigate these cases? So let me just talk about a little bit of stats first. Leading cause of death, according to CDC, when you uh, are discussing infants and children. So the first one, age zero to one, which makes sense, is birth defects. That's the leading cause of death for children ages 0 to 1. But the second leading cause of death is accidents. Now you think about age 0 to 1, what are the possibilities? There's not a lot, right? You're talking about like co-sleeping. You're talking about unintentional smothering. What about accidental overdoses? Children that get access to drugs or medication. What about falls or accidental injuries? So those, those are the type of things that can happen to children ages 0 to 1. Now age 1 to 4. The leading cause of death is accidents, followed by genetic issues, followed by homicide. So ages one to four, homicide, uh, that doesn't sound right, but yeah, absolutely. It can happen. Children get caught up in things, uh, maybe parents uh, murdering their children. I've seen that before. I've seen the cases where mothers will drown their babies in bathtubs. And so, yeah, absolutely. Homicides can happen age one to four, but the number one cause is accidents. Ages 5 to 9, again, accidents is the leader, followed by cancers and then developmental issues. Ages 10 to 14, again, the leading cause of death is accidents, followed by suicide and then followed by cancer. So is accidental deaths in children and infants relevant? You have to know how to investigate these cases. You have to know what type of cases you're going to be potentially exposed to, and you got to be prepared. So again, that's why we do this training. What are the different type of accidents that can occur for, for children? We know adults, they are prone to industrial accidents. Maybe they're out working and they get caught in a machine. And maybe they are out working and fall off a building. And maybe they're DUI drinking and crash into a, a tree at night. Children are somewhat exposed to some of those things, but it's going to be different, right? So children are going to be dying in accidents in different ways than adults will. Will an adult be present most of the times? Usually, right? Because children are usually around adults, but it's different. So the things that, uh, that I've seen and are most common are motor vehicle accidents. That's, that's very common for children. Drownings, uh, residential fires. I've seen cases where there's a fire in a home and people try to get their children out 
but they can't. And then they end up burning to death or they end up being exposed to carbon monoxide. There was a case in our jurisdiction not too long ago where multiple family members escaped, but two of the children were developmentally delayed and they ended up dying in the fire. Um, so it, it can absolutely happen. Chokings. You think about chokings when you are investigating uh, deaths of elderly people, but it's also applicable to children. Children have smaller airways. They're not as accustomed to being able to cough things up whenever they, they swallow them. But kids also put things in their mouths that adults don't. So coins, toys, anything that can go in the mouth, kids are going to do it. And so they can choke. Uh, suffocation. Suffocation, you usually think about uh, smothering in infants, whether it be co-sleeping or a baby being put in a different position. I've had cases where mother is breastfeeding the child and she's just so exhausted that baby falls out of her arms and then falls into a weird position, maybe at the side of a couch. So that's why we do these extreme and uh, over-the-top investigations in children deaths, because how hard would it be to smother a baby and make it look like an accident when it's really a homicide? Those are things that you need to try to figure out when you're out at your scene. Poisoning. Again, children put things in their mouths that they're not supposed to. It could be paints. It could be chemicals. It could be, again, toys. Anything that um, a child has access to, they're probably going to put in their mouth at some point. Electrocutions. Children are also prone to electrocutions because they're playing with things. They're playing with toys around electrical outlets. It's not as common as an adult because adults are usually doing electrical work, but children can have die of electrocution deaths too. And then animal attacks. I've seen cases where children are attacked by the family dog or a neighbor's dog. I've seen those are some of the most violent and horrific cases you will ever see is when a child is mauled by a dog. We, I've seen a, a couple of those actually over the course of my career. And they're always awful to investigate because the injuries are so severe. You know that that child had to endure a lot of pain during that death. That can take its toll on the investigator too. So those are the different types of cases that we're going to be talking about and the, uh, the manner of death is, again, accident. That's what we're discussing. Why do child accidents occur? That's something that you need to think about. We talked about that children are susceptible to some of the same causes of death and manners of death as adults, but they happen in different ways. So how do child accident deaths occur? Children are not as aware of the dangers that are all around us. Vehicles, they don't know how deadly vehicles can be. They run out into streets without looking both ways. I, I can't count the number of times that I've yelled at my kids, you know, out in front of the house playing to look both ways. And they still don't do it. Even at age, you know, 12, 13, and 14, um, they still run out into the street, not aware of the dangers and how deadly cars can be and how people just are not looking out. There was one day I was outside my house and my kids had literally just been out in the street playing softball just a couple seconds before this happened. And so this car came down the street probably at about 80 miles an hour. And about a second behind them was a patrol car chasing them down a residential street. Should have called off that pursuit, but they didn't for some reason. And my kids were out there in the street a second before that. And I mean, that could have been really bad. Uh, fortunately, it wasn't. But those are things that can happen. Even though I am aware of the dangers that happen and the thing, the bad things that happen to people, you just have to make your kids aware of what's going on. But awareness, situational awareness, the dangers that are present, kids are just not as aware of that. Kids are pretty resilient to things, though, like falls and injuries. So if a child does die of a fall or an injury, you have to be very suspicious of that because usually... You know, they're going to be a little more durable. They're more flexible. Their bones aren't fragile as some adults, older adults especially. And so if a child dies of a head injury or some kind of an injury, you have to be very suspicious of that because that means that that injury was very severe. I mean, I can't count the number of times, you know, my kids rolled off of beds or hit their heads on walls and they're doing just fine. So if an injury is bad enough to cause a death, you should be immediately suspicious of that and not just think about, is this an accidental death, but maybe this is a homicide death. Neglect or bad situations. And kids, obviously, younger kids especially, aren't taking care of themselves. It's their parents taking care of them. So think about the things that these parents are exposing children to. It could be drug abuse. I've, I've had several cases now where parents are abusing drugs in the home and younger children. I had a couple that were six, seven, eight in that range. They gained access to either methamphetamine or they gained access to recently fentanyl and they overdosed. So the, the parent is putting their, their children in these bad situations or not being aware of the dangers that their kids could get into, especially with the drugs. 
could be a neglectful situation or just what about cleaning chemicals or things in the home that they, the children could access that, that could cause injury or death. Education. Um, Education is important. Of course, children shouldn't be listening to this podcast and, you know, listening to what I have to say, but definitely parents should edu- educate their children on on what's what could possibly happen to them. That's why accidents occur is it's, there's a, a lot of different situations that kind of build on each other and then an accidental death of a child occurs. Some of the things that I like to talk about during my training is how do you approach these cases? You're going into a very bad situation. You're going into a situation where a child died. So it's not only traumatic for the family, but it's traumatic for officers, EMS, everybody that was on scene, it's traumatic for. And so you're going in there as a death investigator, kind of after the fact, and you're asking a bunch of questions of people that are very stressed out. They're traumatized. So you have to keep that in mind. Do you just go in there and not investigate because everybody's sad? Absolutely not. You have to be good at talking to people. You have to be able to draw this information out of them, even though they're having difficulties. Now, you also have to think about, too, how might these investigations affect you as an investigator? And you have to take that into consideration, too. And if it's something that's just going to be so traumatic for you that you can't investigate it, well, then maybe you need to consider another coworker handling it or maybe even another career because you're going to get these cases and they're going to be hard and you still have to investigate. Like I said, I've got four kids myself, different age ranges, and I have handled tons of infant and children deaths. So you you have to be aware of that. But, you know, for example, do you want your investigator who just had a child and maybe their first child after, you know, multiple pregnancy attempts to be investigating miscarriage deaths or suicide deaths. Do you want them out there investigating these type of cases, knowing that it's going to cause extreme stress on them? I've seen that in my own department where my coworkers come back from maternity leave and then the day or week they come back, they're back in there investigating the, these type of cases. And so sometimes you can't help it, but if, if you have the ability to, as a manager, kind of shift cases around to where you can let your employees just have a little bit of time to raise their child before they jump right into these cases. It's probably a good idea. Another one that I had was a a pregnant coworker, first baby, and she's out investigating multiple uh, miscarriage deaths that absolutely should not be allowed unless there's no other option. So you need to think about this as a manager in taking care of your coworkers because these children deaths, they're difficult. They're hard for everybody. They're hard for families. They're hard for the investigators. And they're especially hard on the death investigators. And most people don't think about that. They think that we can just go in there and handle everything. And I've handled uh, over the course of my career, well over 3,500 death investigation cases. And they're never easy, but you know, you, you get used to it. You get used to doing death notifications and you get used to handling, you know, children and infant deaths, but does it take a toll? It does. And you just have to have some form of stress relief. You have to be able to communicate within your office and you have to shift cases around accordingly. I am going to do a a podcast on uh, wellness and mental health in death investigations. So look out for that one in the future. I'm going to be talking about a lot of different scenarios and things that I've seen over the years. Again, infant deaths are difficult. Children deaths are difficult. Um, We're going to get into a few case studies here in just a minute. When you're out on the scene of infant and children deaths, how do you gather information? Do you just go in there like you normally would, like a suicide death of an adult? Do you just go in there and start talking to people? No, you want to kind of feel the situation out. Maybe you need to have a chaplain there. Maybe you need to have an advocate for that family member. Maybe you need to give that person a little bit of time, like a mother that's lost their, their infant child. Maybe you need to give them a little bit of time before you start bombarding them with a ton of really difficult questions. Do you want to ask them how many miscarriages they've had or if they're breastfeeding their child in front of uh, multiple friends and family? Probably not. So be a little more sensitive in your approach. You're going to get a lot more good information out of a family if you treat them appropriately versus just going there and treating them like they committed a crime. In some cases, maybe they have committed a crime, but you're going to get more information out of them if you treat them with respect and kindness, even if they're guilty of something. So think about that. Resources for gathering information for these type of deaths. You can go to friends. You can go to family. Teachers are great resources. Trying to find out What was going on with this kid before this death? Did they do these type of things before? Like, were they prone to accidents? Did they um, ever have any, like, suicidal ideations? Um, If you're investigating the, the suicide death of a younger person. And then, of course, social media. Social media is great. 
it's always going to give you some insight as to what was going on with that child. Two type of deaths that I really want to focus on in this episode are motor vehicle accidents and then also drowning deaths. Both are equally as awful, right? It seems that you'll get a higher percentage of these type of deaths for infants and children, more so than others. So motor vehicle accidents and drownings. Like I said, there's literally a million ways that infants and children can die. We are going to do another podcast in the future, too, about exclusively suicide deaths, so the sudden and unified infant deaths, which was formerly SIDS deaths, and how to investigate those and differentiate a uh, an infant death that is of natural causes or unexplained natural causes versus something that is potentially accidental. But today we're going to focus on the motor vehicle accidents and the drownings. So motor vehicle accidents. Uh, what are some ways that children can die in motor vehicle accidents? Kind of the same as adults, but again, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a little different because it's involving children. Just a few stats to throw out there. In the United States, every year there is about uh, 43,000 people that die by motor vehicle accident. And about 3% of those are children or younger people under the age of 14. So that's still a pretty high percentage of the deaths. They're younger people, children. And then remember our stats that we talked about before. So those younger children, the younger ages, the higher percentages of those deaths are going to be accidents. So if you're getting an infant or a child death, it's possibly an accident. There's a good possibility it's an accident. Um, so children can be hit by vehicles when they're walking. Remember, they're lower to the ground. It's harder to see them. Uh, like I was saying with my own kids, they run out in the street and they're not paying attention. It's easier for vehicles to not see a child versus an adult and hit them. So pedestrian accidents are more common. Kids are out walking to school. They're walking to buses. So there's a good possibility that they could be hit by a vehicle. They're walking out around buses. Now these bus buses have stop signs, but it drives me crazy every time I'm taking my kids to school and I see that little stop sign go out and people just go as fast as they can to beat that little stop sign, not thinking about that a child is possibly going to be walking out or running out on the other side of that bus. So adults are careless. They're very negligent. They completely dismiss things that have been put in place to protect children. I've seen children hit by trains. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. And then also children and safety seats. I've seen children ejected. I've seen people not using safety seats correctly. One incident that I had uh, personally happened. I live in Central California. And one time I was driving down um, Interstate 5 going to Southern California. And I was driving behind a van. And the van just suddenly swerved, rolled over. And this happened in front of me. I mean, I was not even working at the time. I was just driving. So going to do something personal. And I saw this kid, as the van was rolling, get ejected out of the back window. Kid landed on the ground, probably got ejected about 10 to 15 feet. I immediately pulled over. Fortunately, I had some uh, EMT training. So I went over and kid was spotless. Um, he was complaining about abdominal pain. But that could have been really bad. And turns out that this was the only kid in the car or the only person in the car that was not restrained by a seatbelt. I mean, this is a van, had multiple seats. There were uh, several adults in the car. But this child, for whatever reason, was not restrained. And this person just lost control and rolled their van. There was no other factors involved. It wasn't another vehicle accident. Just a simple lost control, rolled the van. Kid got ejected. That kid could have easily died. Fortunately, they didn't. But it goes back to parenting and being neglectful. And then kids, too, they don't want to wear their seatbelt. They don't know that seatbelts can save your life. Going back to seatbelts, seatbelt laws were enacted back in uh, 1968. That's when the first seatbelt laws were enacted in the, in the United States. And I know for a fact that people were not using seatbelts until way after that because I was born in 1979 and my parents told me that I would sit anywhere in the car. That I would sit on the floorboard. I would sit in the, the trunk uh, with my siblings. And I mean, any of that could have been bad. I mean, it's like a clown car in there where everybody's just kind of bunched in there, not really caring about seatbelts. But, you know, as time went on, people started discussing these things. And then even though seatbelt laws were in place, people weren't enforcing them. They weren't using them. You know, now people are abiding by seatbelt laws more. But still, I was just driving down uh, the street from work, coming home from work the other day. And I look over and there's several people in a car and the mom is holding five or six year old child on their left. They're not restrained by a seatbelt. And, you know, I'm in a work vehicle and they just could care less. So it's just pure negligence. And any one of those situations could go really bad for that entire family and especially that child because they're going to end up dying. Uh, after a while, between like 1977 and 1985, that's when they started enacting more of the laws for 
child restraints. So like car seats and booster seats. So it did start saving more lives, but we still see it. We still see it happening and the children are dying as a result. I'm going to go over a couple cases that I've had that are um, that stick out in my mind. I know I've handled a million of these things, but just some of the ones that, uh, you know, you, as an investigator, you'll, you'll handle so many cases, you start to forget about them, but then, you know, something will trigger your memory and then you'll remember these cases. So I'm just going to talk about a couple. There was these parents driving on a, a roadway here in, in the county that I, I live in. It's a highway. That's 60, 70 miles an hour speed. It was raining. It was dark out. And again, just like that case that I saw the kid get ejected in, uh, this family was in a van. They had plenty of seats, plenty of seat belts. But this uh, younger child, I believe he was uh, probably about seven or eight because he was about the same age as my kids when this happened. So it was a few years back. And kid gets ejected, right? So the, the family, they get out of the car. They can't find the kid. And eventually, in the dark, they find him under the van. He was completely under the van. He was crushed. Um, his head was completely split open. And, you know, I don't mean to be graphic about this stuff, but we're death investigators. We're going to handle this stuff. And so you have to know what you're going to be looking at when you go out to these scenes, especially if you haven't handled this before. I mean, I've handled thousands of these, so it's kind of like not a big deal to me. But uh, newer people that maybe haven't had a motor vehicle accident yet or haven't had a motor vehicle accident involving a child, you're going to be out there. And guess who's going to have to be the one to move that body? And guess who's going to have to be the one to put the kid in a body bag and try to identify them and then talk to the family? It's going to be you, the death investigator. You have have to be prepared. So if you haven't handled these, talk to somebody like myself, maybe ask questions. I'm available anytime. I, I give you my email, phone number, whatever you need. And you can contact me anytime with questions. My email is jeffreygentry.bpa at gmail.com. You can always email me questions. And of course, you can also email me ideas for different topics for these podcast episodes. So we went out there. Um, it took me probably about an hour to get to the scene. And by then, the family had kind of calmed down a little bit, but they were still out there on scene. They wanted to see their kid, but I mean, his head was completely split open. So I didn't feel it was a good idea for them to do a visual identification. Uh, so what I did was I, I took him back to our office, got him cleaned up, um, because you still have to identify this kid, even though there's family there. Um, I think we ended up doing a, a photograph later, just a side profile, black and white photograph. And I do that a lot on a lot of my cases involving uh, younger people because you're not going to have fingerprints. You could do DNA, you could do dental work, but probably, you know, one of the easiest things to do and works pretty well is a, a good side profile photograph of the child or a face, a, a head on uh, ID photograph in black and white. That way it's not as traumatic. They don't see the blood in the photograph. They don't see the injuries. And in that way, you can get a positive identification. I've done that many times. I've met with families and younger people that have uh, died in accidents. There was a girl who was out. She was kind of, she was a runaway actually. And she was hit from behind by, um, by a low profile Honda. And she got ejected about 20 to 30 feet. She hit a uh, power pole uh, as well. So, I mean, she was pretty badly damaged. It took me a while to even track down relatives, but when I did, I had a, a printed black and white photograph of her and I was able to get her identified. I met with her grandparents and she, and they visually identified her. So that is a great way to identify younger people because you don't have fingerprints on file like you would for an adult or even a, a teenager. Think about these ways that you're going to identify people. One case that I had probably in my first or second year of being a death investigator. And when I was trained, I was just kind of let loose. I wasn't given a lot of training. I didn't go to a structured training course. A lot of it was me reading uh, myself and then just on the job training. At the time, I was told that you can't really train death investigators. You have to just go out there and do it. I don't believe that at all. You have to have structured training when you start as a death investigator. Darren has multiple courses through the Death Investigation Training Academy. We can always schedule in-person training courses. Um, I myself teach anything related to death investigation, suicide investigation, blood stain pattern analysis, crime scene investigation. So if you are looking for something like that, uh, reach out to me or Darren at the Death Investigation Academy and we can get something scheduled for your jurisdiction. Uh, but you have to have good formal training when you first start out. That way you know how to handle some of these death investigations. You don't want to go out there and make some of the mistakes that I made early on because I wasn't even aware of how to handle these situations. One such case that I had, you know, I still think about it every single time that I drive by this intersection. I mean, it was a kid that was with his family. They were going to go to some church event and it wasn't very far from their house. So he took off on his skateboard and the family drove. So it was normal for him to ride a skateboard around. He was like 
14, 15. And so he got to this intersection. Uh, it was dark, raining, and somebody hit him. And the family, they went, you know, didn't even know that this happened. They went on to, to their event. And then after a while, they realized, well, you know, he hasn't showed up. So there's got to be something wrong. So they went back to the scene and they see all the police cars. They knew that it was him. They knew that something happened to him. They even called his cell phone and they could hear it ringing out there. But the police didn't want to tell them that it was him. So I got called out. Um, this, this agency was, uh, they usually took a long time to investigate cases. And so I got called out like two or three hours later. The family's still out there. They're sitting in their cars in the rain. All they want is an answer. Is it him or not? So they, they got them into this uh, mobile command center that they had. And I'm standing in there, you know, with these multiple family members. They're all sad. They're crying. They've been out there for multiple hours just waiting for an answer. And I've got a couple little items. I mean, he, he again, was very badly injured. I mean, his his whole head was split open. And there's no way that you could do a visual identification. So what I was going to do was um, show them a couple of items that I had of his property. And I thought this was a good idea. Never been trained on this before. Never had any idea how to handle it. I was out on my own within I believe this was within the first couple months of me starting the job. So I'm standing there and they want to know if it's him. And so I pulled out a couple of things like his skateboard and uh, one of his shoes. And so I remember the dad got so mad at me presenting these items that he just started cursing at me. He said, you knew, he, and sorry to use profanity, but he said, you need to get on with it. So I finally told him, I believe it's him and gave him the cell phone. And that kind of stuck in my mind. It's like, is that how I would handle another death notification like that? I mean, you obviously have to identify this person, but I've found over the years, you can't keep people waiting. People that have been traumatized like that, people that have been through such a horrible thing. If I were to do that now, I would go over and I would tell the family immediately, this is who I am. This is why I'm here. We believe it's your son. Tell me what he was wearing. That way I can confirm that it was him. So you want to be as direct as possible with these death investigations. You don't want to keep a traumatized family waiting more. So that, that stuck with me a lot. As a new investigator, that was, uh, that was pretty rough to handle. But I made it through. I've now been doing it for 15 years. So it's, it's some things to think about. Another case that I had was a, uh, a group of kids that was walking home one night. They were out just kind of in a uh, remote area. This was completely normal for them, just friends walking around. There was nothing in sight. So there was a DUI driver. He veered off the road and he hit this group of kids. I mean, out of nowhere. I mean, this, this is a complete freak accident. These kids were doing nothing wrong. They were far enough off the roadway that they shouldn't have been hit. But this DUI driver veered off and hit them. You got one kid that died on scene. There were multiple families that showed up at the scene. And I remember both of these kids' parents showed up at the scene. The parents were divorced and they hated each other. They absolutely despised each other. The dad was adamant that he was going to go view the body and identify his son. Mom was adamant that dad was not going to do that, that she was going to do it. Not only am I trying to investigate this case of a kid that's about the same age as one of my kids that got hit by a car, but then you're also dealing with these family members who are feuding with one another. So what do you do? You got to then put on you know, your serious hat and tell these family that you guys both have equal rights. You're going to do this together. I'm going to help you through it. We're going to figure out what the next steps are. We got to get him identified. That's step one. We got to be able to do this together. Ultimately, when he goes to the funeral home, both family members are going to have to sign off on it. So I was able to talk to the parents. I had to be a little serious and a little firm, which I do not like doing unless I absolutely have to be. I'd rather be lighthearted and fun and joking around, but there's a time and a place for that. Obviously not on these scenes. I talked to both parents. They agreed. We were able to get through it. We were able to do a visual identification because the kid did not have a lot of uh, visual injuries. And if I can get a uh, younger person visually identified at that scene, to me, that's way better than down the road showing family a photograph and making them wait longer. So kind of like the kid with the skateboard and you know showing them items, I would rather that family be able to see the kid there, identify them, and start the grieving process I think that's a much better approach. Of course, you have to take into consideration injuries and blood and are you going to traumatize the family more? But to me, that's a much better way to do it. I usually conduct my investigations thinking about if this were my family member, how would I want it handled? No matter what your policy says, you have to think about in these type of investigations, if it were your family, how would you want to be treated? And that's how you should treat people. There was uh, another one. I mean, there's so many that I can think of. Uh, one that really sticks out, though, and you can actually look this case up online if you want to. This happened in 2012. 
in Fresno, California. It was a basketball coach um, who was driving home. He was under the influence. So he was a, a children's basketball coach. And I know this for a fact because he actually taught a basketball camp that my son went to. And so I, I knew this guy. I didn't know him personally, but I'd seen him before. I'd seen the way he interacts with children. Uh, he, seemed like, he seemed like an okay guy. He was a little tough, but um, I mean, most coaches are. But never would I have thought that this would have happened. So he was driving home intoxicated. I, From what I understand, he had uh, somebody else with him in the car. This is in the nice part of town. This is in like northeast Fresno, California. I live kind of in the not as nice area. We don't have in my area all the nice crosswalks. We don't have all the nice bike trails. We don't have all the nice lighting. So we do unfortunately get a lot more pedestrian accidents on my side of town than we do in the north side of town. I mean, it's because they've got bike trails out there. They have walking trails. They have better lighting. They have better roads. And that's just a fact. And this family, they were out. They were on an evening bike ride. They were going on this trail. And there was, uh, along one of these roads, there was really nice lighting. There was uh, signs up, just warning of pedestrians possible, possibly crossing. So this family rides their bike out into the road. And this drunk driver, I'll even give you his name. I'm not going to give you the kid's name. But his name was Lauren Lebeau, L-E-B-A-E-U. You can look it up online. There's plenty of news articles about it. He's driving across the road and hits the kid. And the kid gets uh, dragged under his car and he drags him for a while. Then the kid finally comes loose. Family, of course, is devastated on scene. They're running after the car. He finally, I I believe he made it to the hospital, but I think he was probably dead on scene. And the car takes off. So the drunk driver takes off. They later arrest him. They determined that he was DUI, and this guy ended up getting charged and convicted. Uh, He went to prison for eight years. He was released in 2020, and now he is actually back coaching children's sports teams. All of this can be found online. This is just an example of even though things are put in place to protect children, there's always that potential for an unintentional accident or injury that can occur, and it's traumatizing. And it, it's devastating to the entire family. But then you go out there as a death investigator and you have to get information. So you have to still conduct an investigation. So you have to think about how are you going to talk to these people? How are you going to get information from somebody that just saw their child hit and dragged under a car and then that car takes off? It's going to be very difficult. So you really have to work on those communication skills. You have to know how to talk to somebody, not to offend them, but let them know that you're there to help, you're there to conduct an investigation, that this information is going to not only help figure out why their child died, but also help to prevent children from dying in the future. That location now where that accident occurred, this city built an underpass for people to ride their bikes and walk through. Now, this again is the north side of town that has more money. The side of town that I live on, I have never seen something like that built, even though there's intersections where there's tons of people that are hit and killed. So I'm not going to get into political stuff on this podcast, but is there a difference in the way money affects these accidental injuries? Absolutely, there is. The next thing that I want to talk about, um, I know we've been talking a lot about motor vehicle accidents. I want to transition into drownings. And again, there's so many accidental deaths that I've seen. I'm going to do another podcast about these accidental uh, deaths of children because there are some that just stand out that are just so different and unique that I think that death investigators, especially new ones, really need to be aware of some of these cases and the obstacles in investigating them. So drownings. Drownings, uh, if you're talking about age 5 to 19, drowning is the third leading cause of accidental deaths in children. In the United States, there is about 4,000 people that die by drowning every year, and about 900 of those are children. So we're talking about um, almost 25% of drowning deaths are children. That's a a pretty alarming statistic, right? Because there are way more adults out in the water than there are children. Why do children drown more than adults? Well, obviously, there's negligence sometimes on part of the parents, or maybe the kids don't know how to swim. I know adults still that don't know how to swim, but usually as a child, you're taught to swim at a younger age, but some people never learn how to swim. So there's a lot of factors that go into why children drown more so than adults. Where can children drown at? They can drown in swimming pools, whether it be a residential pool or a public pool. I'll talk about both of those. They can drown in bathtubs. When my kids were younger, I remember giving them baths. I was super paranoid, so I never left them alone in the bathtub. 
But we just had a case um, in our area not too long ago where this kid was old enough to sit up. They'd been in the bathtub before. Parents stepped out for maybe five minutes tops and came back. Baby's dead in the bathtub. It can happen that quick. I mean, you're talking about seconds. All it takes is enough time for that child to gulp in enough water and for their airway to be obstructed and they're drowned. If you don't resuscitate them within seconds, they're going to die. So bathtubs are very dangerous for children. Spas. Children are, you know, they see the water, they want to get in. And so spas can be very hazardous. You have to keep those things covered. You have to keep gates around them. That's why there's laws about swimming pool gates. And then also um, one of the weirdest ones that I've ever seen is children drowning in buckets. There was a case where mom was at home cleaning she was uh, distracted by other children for just a short period of time. And then her youngest child, who just barely started walking, you would never imagine that this could happen. But this kid flipped over into the bucket face down. Mom comes back in, baby's dead, drowned in, in the bucket. Obviously, this came out as very suspicious. And rightfully so, it should be investigated as very suspicious because it's so uncommon. But can it happen? Absolutely. Children can even drown in just very small amounts of water, like ponds, backyard swimming pools, those little inflatable ones. They can all be very dangerous. You have to keep an eye on your children if they're swimming, especially if they don't know how to swim. It's just parenting knowledge. Some people don't have the education. They don't know that all these things can be so dangerous. We as death investigators are aware of everything being hazardous, right? I mean, even, you know, air quality is scary, right? The food that you ingest is scary, just think about waterways and vehicles and all the different things that can happen. Some parents just aren't even aware. One case that I had not too long ago, this, this one is pretty awful. These parents, they went out to this kind of remote area. It was, it was a little river. It was a, a river that ran, th ran through our county. People would go out there all the time, but it was a remote area, right? They had very limited cell signal. Two parents out there and two children. There was an older girl and a, a younger kid. The younger kid and the little girl, they, you know, they got out of the car, they were unpacking, parents were getting all the food and, and things out because they, they were prepared for a good time. And they let the kids sit by the edge of the water. It didn't look dangerous. I saw the exact spot. I went out there and saw the exact spot where they went in, but it was kind of uh, soft sand. So these kids, of course, they're not going to sit there. They want to play in the water. They didn't have any life jackets on. They stepped into the, uh, the water and the soft sand just started giving way. Neither of them knew how to swim. So the little one went in, the older girl tried to grab the little one, was able to get the little kid out. By then, parents came running over, but by then the little girl, um, she was a little bit older, she went in the water and started getting washed downstream. She went underwater. Dad, who doesn't know how to swim too, he jumps in, tries to save her, and he ends up drowning at the same time. We've had multiples like this where multiple people drown trying to rescue each other. The mother is out there with the little child witnesses all of this, sees her husband and her child drowned, and then she's got to wait for rescue personnel to get there. And then they finally recover these people from the water. So imagine the state of this person's mind. Um, I never got to talk to her even. I actually got all my information from some of the investigators, the dive team that was out there, because it took a while for them to recover the bodies. So the immediate family, the, wife, the mom and uh, the other kid weren't even on scene anymore. Uh, they'd been taken somewhere else. So I got all my information from the investigators. But the things that I wanted to know about was I wanted to know the water temperature. Uh, that can affect drowning. Uh, colder water, you have a little longer period of time that you might be able to resuscitate the person. I wanted to know the current speed. I wanted to know the direction the current was going. What uh, hazards were there? And me as a death investigator, I really like going out to the scenes because I want to see firsthand what exactly happened. I don't want to just hear it from somebody because they can never describe it like it will be if you see it. So I went out there and I took pictures of everything. It didn't look too dangerous. I was able to see the area, but it, just that soft sand that gave way. I wanted to see it firsthand and I wanted to see how the child went in and how the dad uh, went in as well. After all of this, I actually had another family member. There were tons of family out there. They were just waiting. I had the other family members, um, I, I think it was an uncle, identified both the, uh, the male and the child. They visually identified them. And so we transported their bodies back to the morgue after they were identified. Because otherwise, how are we going to get that child identified? There's no definite way to identify them. Even though the mom says that the, that's the child that went in, you still have to have some form of positive identification. Because if it's ever questioned down the road, you could get really jammed up if you don't have an official identification. As these family members were leaving, I remember one of the family members, their car broke down out there. 
And so after all of this, after they went through losing a child and uh, multiple family members, and after I had to, you know, it took me multiple hours to get there because they had to rescue these these people. And by the time I get there, so they've been out there for hours. I mean, these people are probably exhausted. They're mentally drained. And then their car breaks down. After all of that, I gave these people, it was three different family members, maybe four. I gave them a ride back into town and it took about an hour to an hour and a half of driving for me to get them back into town. Um, there was a little bit of a language language barrier. Most of the family members were primarily Spanish speaking, and I didn't understand Spanish real well. And that was the most awkward car ride ever. I remember talking to one of the person, and we were, we were trying to make small talk with each other, but it was it was just horrible. So a very traumatic event for everybody. Drownings are awful things for families to endure. Another one that I had was a child that snuck between a fence. So these people lived in an apartment and their the apartment fence was faulty. It was a, like a backyard fence. This child was able to get out of the apartment into the backyard like little it was just a tiny apartment patio. They snuck past the faulty apartment fence because it was under construction. Then that child didn't live too far away from the pool, but they they had to travel a little distance. And this is a pretty young kid. So no, I mean, young enough that this this child was still in a diaper. So kid goes from the apartment, out the fence that was faulty, and then travels a good distance, and then gets to the pool. And the pool fence was also faulty. So the apartment complex, even though they had been inspected, they never fixed the fence. And so this kid was able to slip through the fence and then goes into the pool. The kid was discovered by other children who rescued the kid, pulled him out. They, they of course, didn't know how to do CPR. So, I mean, unfortunately, this poor little child didn't have a chance. But just think about all of the things that went wrong to lead up to this child's drowning. Faulty backyard fence, faulty pool fence, people not paying attention for a period of time. This kid was left unattended long enough to where they could get out of the fence, walk all the way to the pool, and then drown. There's so many different factors that went into this death that you need to investigate. So you need to take pictures of these areas because, I mean, there's potentially going to be lawsuits in these type of cases. This is definitely a case that's going to lead to a, a, a civil deposition at a minimum, maybe even criminal charges. So you have to take pictures of that fence. You have to take measurements. You have to take pictures both inside the apartment, outside the apartment. You have to take pictures inside and outside of the pool. You have to consider the depth of the pool. Uh, were there cameras that were available to to see this child drowning or walking to that that area? A lot of this is going to be done by the police investigators, but the death investigation is independent of any law enforcement investigation. So you have to make sure it also is thorough. You are looking for, again, cause and manner of death. So was this an accident? Was this an intentional death? Nobody saw this kid going through this pool fence or the apartment fence. It was all speculation, of course. But could the parent possibly put their child in this situation? Absolutely. So you have to always consider that. Keep that in the back of your mind. If this turns into a homicide, do I have enough information to explain what happened? That's how you should always conduct your death investigations. Another one, I'll just do a couple more. Um, I mean, I could talk about this for days. And again, I am going to do another podcast about child death investigations, going into some that maybe involve like consumer products. That's always very interesting as well. And then also I want to talk more about infant deaths and co-sleeping versus accidents versus actual suet deaths that are truly unexplained deaths. I want to talk about the differences. The one that I had was a death of a child. Good family. They were very attentive. They had multiple children. All the kids were outside uh, just kind of hanging out. So the, the youngest child was out there being attended to by the older children. And this kid wore a, a life jacket. And so he, you know, he didn't know how to swim very well. Um, he had some abilities, but the other kids were watching him. And the family was right there. They had a window that looked out into the backyard, but it was an above ground pool. So it was not in a ground level. Pool. All the kids were out there hanging out. The rule was that they would remove the ladder when they were done swimming. Well, the older kids got distracted, and when they were done swimming, everybody was out. They confirmed everybody was out, but they forgot to remove the ladder. And the way it was positioned, you couldn't see it from the window. And so kid ends up missing. I mean, we're talking about maybe an hour going by. And then finally, the family realizes kid's missing. And then they go out, they look, they realize the ladder is in the pool. And then they finally find him floating face down in the pool. He had drowned. Um, they rushed him to a hospital, which is very common in these drowning cases. EMS, just like most infant deaths, they're going to always transport the person to the hospital to try to resuscitate them. Obviously, you know, he didn't make it. The family all responded to the hospital. So 
not only did I go to the scene to get all my photographs, I wanted to look at the height of the pool, the depth, water temperature. I wanted to actually see this ladder myself. Could a child really climb this and get into the pool himself? What was the visibility from the window to the pool and vice versa? You know, could the kids see their parent while they were out there? And then, you know, how many people were really there? Were there locks on the doors? Was there a gate around the pool? Those are all really important things to consider during your death investigation. But I ended up talking to the family there at the hospital, and they were obviously devastated. And I remember, you know, standing out there in the hospital talking to the mom, and she was just in tears the whole time. You know, she was just in complete shock. So she probably would never remember me. She would probably never remember the questions that I asked. But I, I was very, very compassionate towards her, very understanding that, you know, this is a very difficult time. And even if I couldn't get all my questions answered then, I, I built a rapport with that family member to where I could go back at a later time and they would remember that at least at a minimum that I was very kind to them, that I was understanding. So I could get my questions answered a little later if I had to. Maybe right then wasn't the most appropriate time. Those are just some of the things that can happen in drowning deaths. One of the things that um, led to some laws related to pools and drowning deaths is the Virginia Graham Baker Act. And if you don't know what this is, it's, it's pretty awful. Uh, there's a lot of information about it on Wikipedia if you want to read up on it. So it's the Virginia Graham Baker Act, and it's related to pool and spa suction drains. Back in June of 2002, there was a seven-year-old girl by the name of Virginia Graham Baker she was a good swimmer. She was on a dive team. She was very used to the water. She knew how to swim well. Well, there was a faulty drain cover, and she got uh, attached to it at the bottom of the pool. And the suction from the pool was enough to keep her underwater. So she wasn't strong enough to fight the suction of the pool drain. People finally got her out, and she was, of course, deceased, which led to people starting to think about pool safety. And can these things happen? There is, are videos online, uh, if you're interested of this happening to kids. There's one in particular that I saw not too long ago. I think it was on TikTok or YouTube of this kid that the same thing happened. Even though these laws are in place, this pool um, suction drain, I don't know if it was faulty or if it was just too powerful, but this kid got sucked under and these people actually saved him by taking gulps of air and then going underwater and giving him CPR until they could remove him from the pool. So these people saved his life. But it's a pretty horrible video to watch, but it shows you just how this can happen. And there, there were other kids there with him when this happened. After that injury in 2002, some time went on. And then in 2007, an even worse case, a girl by the name of Abigail Taylor, she was six years old, she fell in a pool or a spa and the drain actually sucked part of her body out of her, um, her lower end. So sucked some of her intestine out, obviously killed her. But what an awful death. If, if you've ever watched Final Destination before, uh, go to Final Destination 4. And it's, of course, very dramatized, but it is based off of that death. Um, so this guy's out at the pool. He gets sucked down to the bottom, and the suction increases and uh, sucks some of his, his intestine and lower body out of his, out of his anus area. That's kind of what happened. So all of these deaths started bringing attention to some of these pool drain covers and, and how are pools designed? Are they safe? So in 2007, there were about 174 entrapment issues where people's hair or jewelry or clothing or body parts got sucked down to the bottom of these pools. And so 36 kids ended up dying or 36 people ended up dying. And so in 2008, they enacted the Virginia Graham Baker Act and started designing pool covers that would not allow this. Some pools are set up with two drains. That way, the pressure is distributed between two drains as opposed to just one. Public health inspectors now are required to go out and inspect these pools, and they'll shut them down if they haven't updated their uh, drain systems. That is just a couple examples of how children can die in accidents. I know we just primarily focused on motor vehicle accidents and drownings, but it just shows that as a death investigator, you're going to handle these type of cases, and they're going to catch you off guard. They're going to be when you least expect it, but you're going to have to go out there. You're going to have to get information. You're going to have to learn how to talk to families when they've experienced extreme trauma, and even yourself. You're going to be traumatized by some of these things that you see and some of these cases that you have to investigate, but you have to go out there. You have to do your job, and the way that you can prepare is by getting adequate training. You can listen to podcasts like this. You can go to training on the Death Investigation Academy. Myself, I like to train in person. So you can schedule training. Darren also does training in person. And you can set up these classes to where you can get your investigators training so where they can be a little better prepared. I mean, these cases are always going to catch you off guard. But 
training and education is your best investigator tool that you're going to have. Again, my name is Jeff Gentry. I am a deputy coroner. I've been doing it for 15 years. I also teach for the Death Investigation Training Academy. I teach death investigation, blood stain pattern analysis, and I teach suicide investigation. I'm a certified blood stain pattern analyst and a certified crime scene analyst. And if you like my podcast, let me know ideas, things you'd like to hear about. I have a lot of unique experiences that I like to share with others, um, especially new investigators, so they can be prepared when they go out to these cases. Thank you for listening. My email is jeffreygentry.bpa at gmail.com. And then you can reach out to me through the Death Investigation Academy.